the evangelist George Whitfield was known for his uh, spectacular preaching and the wonderful effect that it had on the early American colonies as well as Great Britain. One of the distinctive marks of his preaching was that he preached outdoors. He would go out into the fields and uh, folks would come from all around to hear him preach the gospel. He had something of an actor's background uh, growing up in an inn and he had uh, in his early life a fascination with acting and you could see some of the dramatic uh, effects uh, that acting had on his preaching ministry as he explained the power of God's grace. Uh, it said that uh, uh, he would move people to tears by the way he pronounced Mesopotamia. <laughs> I didn't see that I had that same reaction. <laughs> But he had a powerful influence in the early colonies. Uh, uh, he was an Anglican priest who uh, was Calvinistic in his um, uh, understanding of, of the gospel message, and he preached that gospel powerfully. Uh, the story is of Benjamin Franklin that he hated to go to listen to Whitfield because he would always end up uh, emptying his pockets and giving an offering to uh, Whitfield, uh, in, in part because Whitfield was. Uh, developing an orphanage in Georgia, just south of Savannah, and as he would preach, he would talk to folks about this orphanage that he was building and the need of the community to uh, support that effort. Benjamin Franklin one time decided he was going to attend Whitfield's message but not bring any money with him at all. That would stop it, right? Well, with Whitfield, uh, Pleading the case of these poor orphans in Georgia, uh, Franklin was so moved that he took off his gold watch and put that in the offering and pledged to come back and pay for it and buy it back again. So, Mesopotamia. <laughs> Whitfield was concerned to not simply present the gospel of Christ and win souls and bring people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, bring them the hope of eternal life. That was the main thrust of his ministry, but it also had a social concern. He was concerned for the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden, the needy. And so his uh, ministry involved also this orphanage down in Georgia. He had grand plans for that orphanage. Not only would he uh, provide a home for uh, boys in particular, it was the Bethesda home, which incidentally, as I understand it, is currently in operation in Georgia to this day. It is the oldest uh, charitable institution in the United States still existing uh, from, from that, that period of time. And so it's a rather remarkable ministry. Uh, Whitfield eventually had to, of course, uh, pass on responsibility for the orphanage to other hands, but he uh, started this great work and he had a vision as well of forming a college where these young boys would uh, be taught and instructed so that they could be effective citizens in God's world. Whitfield had a Christian worldview that attended his preaching of the gospel message and he would have an impact upon the world in a uh, spectacular way. Some folks today get rather nervous when we talk about a social conscience or social work or in the uh, controversial phrase a social justice concern. Uh, for many it might sound like we are advancing a liberal gospel, a sense that man is saved by his good works a sense that the Christian should be actively involved in these things as Jesus fed the poor and healed those who were sick and the Christian should be involved in these kinds of ministries. Uh, but the concern for some folks, particularly in the fundamentalist, evangelical, conservative, even Cal some Calvinistics, Calvinistic uh, believers, uh, the concern is that that is reflecting a works righteousness approach to ministering to people. What we need to do is to preach the gospel. And certainly that is true. Uh, we must preach the gospel. That is foundational to all of life. We cannot properly minister to people unless we minister to their spiritual needs first. 
But there is also the power of the gospel to transform lives and to provide mercy ministries to those who are in need. James, the brother of Jesus, was very concerned about Christian social ethics, social justice, if you will. Not in the way perhaps that progressives understand social justice, but a Christian understanding of social justice. He was concerned that the poor be taken care of, the orphans and the widows be housed and visited in their distress. He was concerned that those who were wealthy not oppress the poor by defrauding them of their proper wages. They would use many different schemes or maneuvers or legal maneuvers to keep the poor oppressed. When you're in a position of power, you can put your thumb on the poker table and have all the chips slide your way. And so James was concerned for social justice and for the well-being of the poor, particularly within the Christian community, but the poor in general. Uh, you find him in the latter part of his letter using very strong language against those who are rich and powerful and wealthy, who are focused all on themselves and their wealth and have no care or concern about those who are poor and needy. This was contrary to Christian faith, contrary to the gospel, and those who were so self-absorbed that they had no care or compassion for those who were weak, were in distress, uh, James uh, saw as coming under the curse and wrath of God himself. James had a social conscience. Now, we've been speaking about God's Word. God's Word as being the, that inspired revelation of God whereby he informs us of his will, how we are to be made right with God, and how we are to live before him. God's word is without error, and not only with regard to matters of theology and ethics, but also in every aspect of life which it addresses. It speaks the truth, and we can rest in that which it says. We have to understand what it says, make sure we understand it properly, but everything that it affirms is true, particularly as we see that in the original manuscripts and our copies and translations are reliable records of what God has given to us. James holds the same high view of Scripture. He considers it as the Word of God, and therefore he uh, talks about the effect of that Word in the life of God's people. He speaks of it being implanted within our hearts. That word, and probably I have to think, James had in mind the parable that Jesus told of the sower and his seed. As he cast that seed in a variety of soils, some responded quickly, some did not respond at all, and some would actually produce a fruitful crop. And James speaks of this implanted word, this word, the seed of the word that comes into our lives and produces fruit, should produce fruit. He is concerned that Christians not simply be those who hear the word of God, listen to it, perhaps from Sunday to Sunday or uh, in their own personal readings or what have you, but they should also be doers of the word. That word should have an effect in their lives. And so James writes to the Christian community, the Jewish Christian community, by and large, but Christians in general, about the reflection on God's Word. Last week we spoke of the importance of meditating on God's Word, how we are to have a disciplined study of Scriptures. Meditate on it. Think about what it has to say. Embrace it in all of its depths and see how it shows us Jesus in His glory and in His work. That ought to occupy our hearts and minds. James says uh, we ought to look intently at the law of God. The description of the gospel. Incidentally, he describes the gospel there as a law. A law that brings us liberty. But specifically in, in its effects and how we are to live socially among others. We are to focus intently on that law. And then have that law bear fruit in our lives. 
Uh, he is concerned that there are some who come and have the word proclaimed in their ears. They hear what it has to say, but then as soon as they get up, leave the building, or go out into their everyday lives, they've completely forgotten the, the message of the scriptures. They fail to see how it applies to their specific life and their individual circumstances. They just go back to their old ways. And here James reminds us, reminds us of the, the power of habit in your life. You have a certain set of habits that dominate you, that organize your life. This is what I do from day to day, from week to week, year after year. And sometimes those habits are challenged by the Word of God. There needs to be a change. Well, when you hear that word addressing you, specifically with regard to old habits, the habits of the old nature, that are continually at work within you, you need to hear that message in humility, receive the rebuke or the correction that God's word has to say to you, and respond accordingly and make changes in your life. We spoke a moment ago of the law of God and how it not only addresses the outward command, but also the causes, the, the motivations, the provocations that lead us into sin. We need to take the Word of God as it's implanted within us and then apply it to the various habits of life that dominate our mind, our affections, our feelings, and make changes and bring our lives more and more into conformity with Christ and His will. See, the power of habit, as Jay Adams would often tell us, or tell Christian pastors in his books and his writings, he would say that habits can work for you or against you. You have old habits that work against you. Uh, he, Dr. Adams would point to uh, Paul's letter in Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul says that, let him who steals, steal no more. But rather, uh, let him work with his own hands so that he might uh, provide for his own needs and for those of others as well. You see, here's the change that takes place in an individual's life. The one who steals must stop that evil habit and turn from that habit and replace it with a new habit. No longer stealing, but rather working and providing for others. You see the pattern?